Welcome to a podcast on marketing. I'm your host, Jordan Ogren, and this is a podcast where we talk about marketing. The first question, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, my name is uh, Diego Pineda, and I'm a marketer, content writer. been doing this for a long time, both for B2B companies and my own companies at some points in life. Uh, now I specialize in writing about sales, marketing for SaaS companies, and also helping uh, authors, aspiring authors, publish their books and become thought leaders. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. So the first question I like to start off with is kind of just seeing a little more about you is what are you or what have you been obsessed with lately? Maybe in regards to business marketing, but obviously if it's something outside of that, feel free to share of something you've just been kind of geeking out about lately. It's an interesting question, and actually, my view on marketing has evolved in the past few years, especially since uh, working with uh, B2B companies, very obsessed about SEO, about rankings and keywords and stuff like that, and seeing that it's just a rat race where we're just competing for keywords, and one day we're on top, and the next day we're not, and okay, what do we do, and then getting traffic, but there's not qualified traffic, so just rethinking uh, all those traditional approaches to marketing and I realized in just talking to a lot of marketers and like, successful people out there, realized that the key to this is just creating original thought leadership, like creating content that positions you as the go-to expert in the industry and just gets you ahead of the pack, right? And just look at your strengths and I mean, you can see in the B2B world, you can see companies like Gong, they just decided to do something really different, right? With branding and with data-driven content and just being crazy out there and doing things that you never saw, like uh, B2B companies uh, doing uh, a Super Bowl commercials, but they did, right? So just doing something different and standing out. And for the solopreneur, for the small business, just, you know, just getting out there, spreading uh, the, your ideas and creating a community. So it's not about this is what we do, but this is how we help you. So, and, and this is, and sometimes it's just taking a stand and having an, a, a, an opinion that's different. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I recently, uh, I have a book uh, just, just came out, The Soul of Thought Leader. And one of the chapters there is about content marketing. And the title is Content Marketing is Dying long live thought leadership and i published that article the excerpt, excerpt from that article on medium and got some it's got a lot of traction a lot of people reading it uh but also uh, people got offended like what do you mean it's 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 not that you're wrong like uh but it's okay i mean i'm i'm taking a stand i believe it because <laughs> it's my experience and I even have a quote in there from uh, Neil Patel that says, uh, SEO is hard and it's getting harder every single day, right? And that's especially true for the small business owner, for the solopreneur, for the marker that just starting. So we have to do something different. And that's what I'm obsessed about, how to help people and companies just uh, stand out, do things differently and you know, just create thought leadership where people would say, hey, I'm thinking about, okay, you think who's the guru uh, in finances or who's the guru in self-help, right? So you say self-help, you think Tony Robbins, right? Because it, it's he's, he's a thought leader, he's published, he's out there. So you gotta be that person if you wanna stand out and really make a difference. Yeah, no, I like that. Definitely a shift in the perspective of SEO and maybe some of these pieces of content that don't have any uh, life in them, but they just rank very well or there are no opinions and such and kind of rethinking and figuring out what is the right approach, being different, having your own opinion, taking a stand. I like that. Just in general, I'm a huge relearner. I like, you know, being wrong. I think it's fun to be wrong because then you can be closer to the, the right answer rather than thinking you're right and never uh, saying you're wrong, but being totally off, still doing the playbook of HubSpot in 2010 or whatever. So that, that's good. Another question that I like to start with that is super easy and just I'm already expecting your answer to be quite simple is what is marketing? How do you define the job that marketing should get done? 
marketing is just creating interest. That's it. And then sales will come and, and the sales process will do it. But it's just creating interest. And I mean, you know, there's inbound marketing, there's outbound marketing, is uh, pull or push. And the way I define it is, let's say you have a showroom where you have your products. And inbound is just, you know, you have flashy signs and you have uh, stuff going on and people will just come to the showroom. And outbound is you just go out and tell people, hey, come to the showroom. <laughs> you got to come and see this, right? You're just pulling people in. So that's, that's the difference. But you're creating interest. And you can have either a sales process after that or you can have a self-serve product where people just make decisions and just just click on it, uh, swipe the credit card and buy. Uh, but that's just part of, of the final part of the sales process. But marketing is simply, you know, attracting the attention and creating interest. So do you see if we were to think in just like the old funnel or the old kind of customer journey, you see marketing stopping at a certain point or do you see marketing going through the entire funnel? Even once they made a purchase, marketing still should be doing things, whether it's retention, because obviously the opposite of interest, aka awareness, is retention, it's resonance, it's going deeper with said people. Do you find that marketing still has a place in that or do you kind of firmly believe marketing is just for awareness, you know, rip the shirt off in the middle of the street, get people to look at me, and then it's everybody else's job to like actually explain or convert to them. Or do you see marketing, you know, somewhat being more throughout the process as well, education, all these things that obviously drive interest, but also can drive retention and kind of resonance with customers? Yeah, I mean, it depends. Uh, you still have to do education. You still have to do you know, follow up, you still have to retain your customers. Uh, whoever does that, whether it's marketing, whether it's customer success, whether it's just uh, the salespeople following up and just uh, uh, doing uh, support and upselling and cross-selling, I, mean, I think it's indifferent. I mean, you can have a company that you have this department. I think you have, you can, you have to do it. It doesn't matter who does it. It depends on the organization. But as long as you do it and you just keep satisfying customers and you know even even um, hubspot came up with the flywheel that it's not just a funnel they, they switch from the funnel to the flywheel and you get a const constantly people coming in and out and it just it's uh it feeds on itself right so you don't have to be uh just going out and getting people into the funnel down below and then to repeat the process again but it's it's a cycle so yeah i mean you still have to do it but uh it's just semantics whether marketing or or customer success that's it yeah no that that makes sense and you can argue is marketing a position or is marketing more of a action you know like we're marketing to our customers marketing might only do this bit of marketing but customer success or as you kind of see with more personal brands popping up it's almost like everybody should be doing marketing even if you don't have the marketing title and to your point it could just be semantics of who is the executioner of that step of the marketing process but it's kind of for me at least i, I feel it's very important because anybody can get attention in today's economy you just put something up that can draw you know people's eyes ball eyeballs but really what I find important is that resonance. It's taken them a steep, a step deeper. Um, but who does that? That can be, you know, dependent on the organization. So I like to think, and I, I don't like to think in dichotomies and black and white. But sometimes it, it's helpful to think of what is good marketing and what's bad marketing. Like, what is a bad way to do a bench press? What is a good way to do a bench press? How do you break up that dichotomy of? You know, you look at something, you say that's some good marketing, or you do it yourself and you say that's good marketing, or you do something and you say that was bad, let's change it. How do you kind of look at good and bad um, in marketing? Uh, I think you can, you, you could go many different ways and maybe different examples, but I'm um, just thinking about Top uh, Is it about you or is it about the customer? And I think bad marketing is when it's all about you. Like, look at us. Uh, because it, it's it's not the same thing to say uh, that let's say your your slogan or your tagline, if it's number one sales training company in the world, or is said uh, uh, sell more with I don't know with X method right and get results 
right? So you are either marketing to the person or you're just self-promoting. And I think self-promotion is what would, I would consider bad marketing. Hmm. I like that. That's a simple framework, right? Is it about you? Is it about your customer? Uh, and good marketing is obviously always inherently customer orientated focus in bad marketing. Um, laughable marketing is all about me. Look at me. I can do this or, or yeah, no, I like that. That's a simple way to think through it. Yeah. And, and just give, give you one, one uh, funny example, like uh, here where I live, uh, so we live by a huge lake and we have to cross the, the bridge to the other side of the lake to go to town. And then when we're coming back, there's a lot of billboards. And especially the, the real estate agents, they just love to, to have, uh, you know, buy those uh, ad space in those billboards. But I, I just laugh because they're so bad. Like, it's just their picture, their name, and a couple of logos of, you know, licensed real estate. So what's, what, what's in it for me, right? What, what's the benefit? There, there's no benefit to it. It's just them, it's their picture or certified realtor. Uh, there's nothing about what they do. It's just a bunch of, and they keep doing that. They don't know any better, right? But I, I, I'm just thinking I could make a lot of money if I just become like a marketer for real estate <laughs> <laughs> and advise these people. But that's not my passion, so I'm not doing that. But uh, you know, it's like just a little. Just you just have to tweak a little bit and make it about okay. I can I can move you in into your new house in 90 days, something like that, something that speaks to the need of people, right? Like save on closing costs or find the, your dream home, something like that. There's not just a uh, best realtor in 2010. Who cares? It's 2022. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's what happens when um, people don't really know how to think about uh, marketing because then you just kind of do what everybody else is doing without like as, as you just applied some critical thinking, you would obviously get to the point of like, what does that person care about? There's uh, Stephen Pressfield, I believe, wrote a book about writing, like nobody wants to read your shit. I find that very true about nobody cares about you until they care kind of what you can do for them. We're all selfish beings. I'll be the first to admit it. So yeah, that's critical to focus on them because nobody's going to care about you until it's like you can tie it somewhat to, okay, they can do this for me. Now, okay, I'll care about them, whether that's subconsciously or you say it consciously. So one question I really enjoy to hear uh, responses is, what is one of the strongest held beliefs you have about marketing? What's a hill in marketing you're willing to die on? And maybe not everybody sees it or believes in you could have shared one of those opinions, but uh, does anything come to mind for a really strong held belief or a point of view on marketing that you have? I would go back to what I said uh, at the beginning is that what works for big companies doesn't work for the small guy, right? So there are ref different rules in marketing. And I really believe that, for instance, if you're just starting out, uh, the best bet is to establish yourself as a go-to expert and, and just create original uh, thought-provoking content. Uh, but people just believe, okay, let's do Facebook ads, let's do Google ads, let's just spend money on, on advertising because that's what the big companies do, right? Uh, but you don't, have, you don't have the budget or the money to spend on big campaigns to compete for, for eyeballs, right? You just have to create, find a niche and the, the smaller or the more defined the niche, the better. It doesn't mean you have to sell only to that niche but it just simplifies your marketing. And that's something I, I really strongly believe. Um, I've seen some discussions on LinkedIn, uh, whether to niche or not to niche. And I would say, yes, you have to niche. I mean, you have to be, if, because if you try to be everything to everybody, the only thing you can compete um, with is pricing. And then someone is always gonna beat you at pricing, right? Like Walmart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I, that leads into a question that I ask a lot is what do you disagree with other uh, marketers on? Maybe that part you, you're saying a different niche. I say niche. I don't know. Niche. Like what? So is that something that people say online? You don't need it. You can kind of whether they don't say you can be all things, all people. But that's something you disagree with. You believe you have to whether you're a solopreneur or you're a company, you have to figure out 
your niche and do you just dis, you describe a niche as a target market a small select target market or is it a small select thing you do for a bunch of people how do you think through like niching down quote unquote yeah i mean there's uh there's different ways but i think uh usually you don't find it i i say you let the niche find you especially if you're if you're a small uh, solopreneur and you have to test and see what, let's say you're just a solopreneur, an entrepreneur starting a small business, right? And, and you say, okay, uh, do you just create something and then go out there and try to sell it? I think that's the wrong way to do it. First, you create a market. First, you test some ideas. And I was, uh, I was even even big companies are doing this. Like I heard about this um, this bank in the in the UK. They just created this landing page. Uh, a few years ago about this new digital bank and it, it was it was different it was uh, I, don't, I don't remember if it was about crypto or anything but they just had like the landing page and a picture of the credit card it was nicely designed and they said will you be interested in in this uh, type of uh, bank account we will launch it uh, we will open it only for 3,000 people sign up here if you want well they had about 40,000 people sign up for it and they had not created anything. They had not created the product. They were just testing. But that was validation that people wanted it. You could have another bank who could have spent a year spending billions or millions of dollars creating a product and then trying to sell it and nobody wants it. So you have to test things out. And that's how you find, okay, is this resonating? And am I am I comfortable? doing this is this something i'm passionate about is there like uh, economic potential like can i make money with it is there a market for it and are people interested and that's how you find your niche right how that's how you you decide so you create the market and then you sell to the market not the other way around mm. yeah no i like that just your kind of sound bite that the niche finds you you kind of you know you have to do things but it you know eventually finds you so testing i you know highly agree greatly agree with that i you know lean startup all those books about kind of mvps all this testing so like you use one example of kind of a landing page gaining signups what other ways can whether it's a solopreneur small business what other ways can they test you know whether it's a new product or even currently if it's you know hitting the right resonating as you said what are some other ways that you've seen or you could think of to test a niche quote unquote okay so there, there, are, there are a few ways so let me tell you um so last year i decided okay uh i love writing i'm an author i write books what if i have a side gig where i teach people how to write books uh who should i target so i thought maybe see executives business leaders because you know they're experts they know their stuff so but i say i'm gonna test it and then i start posting on linkedin start creating a community and after a while i looked at okay who's following me who's uh commenting who's liking my posts who's following and i realized they were solopreneurs coaches consultants not c executives not business leaders and i said okay this is the people who my message is resonating with this is my niche. So I, so I changed my language and I started talking to them. And I started talking to the, to the coach, to the consultant. And my examples were about them. Not about the, the C executive, but about the, the career coach, the financial coach, the fitness consultant, right? So that's one way that just create your content and see what, who's, who's commenting, who's saying, yes, I like, who's raising their hand. So you're looking for signals. Another one is, uh, is you just uh, use surveys or, or tests, uh, polls, whatever you can do, and just ask people questions and see what it's a simple way. Let's say you're thinking about something and let's say you say, uh, somebody asked me uh, how to do X, whatever you do. And uh, I answer him that you have three ways and A, B, and C. Which one will you be more interested in learning about? And then you can start seeing, okay, people are interested in this. Or you can say, okay, what's the, the most pressing issue with your business? Is it revenue? Is it scaling the business? Is it uh, 
finances, is it sales and marketing? And then you can start, you know, just talking to people and just get on the phone or just emailing and you say, okay, what's the biggest challenge? Not because you want to sell something, but you're doing research. So uh, here's the thing, you know, market research used to be a huge thing and companies would pay agencies to do market research. Now we don't need to. Now we can do market research by ourselves. But uh, we can get lazy and not do it. <laughs> and just copy <laughs> what everybody else is doing. Yeah, no, that's good. So almost to break those two different avenues up, one's almost passively. You're just posting. You're kind of passively watching who raises their hand, what's going on. And another is much more active. I'm going to position a question, a survey, a type form, something that will draw answers where the other is kind of passively. It takes maybe longer, but probably get better results than this one. You have to have A, enough people and all that. And I think one thing just inherent in all of this is having a willingness to pivot. You know, you didn't, you weren't so stuck on the CEOs that, hey, if I can't sell the CEOs, you know, like I don't want to do this or whatever. So you were able to pivot, whether that's in, uh, you know, having humbleness, whatever that is in, you're able to say, hey, this is the way that I need to go. I'm going to throw away my old model that I thought worked or thought would work. And now I'm going to go with this new one rather than almost like seeing the information because I think with data, a lot of times it's data, but it's what we do with it, where some people can look at the same set of data and say, well, actually, you should have kept going for CEOs because, you know, you were in the wrong place. You need to go to Vistage groups or whatever, where like, you know, you were probably more objectively like, I don't care which way I go. I want to just go the right way. And the data spoke to you that way. So I, I find a lot of people say, you know, trust the data, but it's more or less being somewhat almost like a scientist, like they want to prove themselves wrong rather than prove themselves right, where a lot of marketers don't want to be wrong. So we look at the data and almost try to manipulate it to say, hey, we should keep doing SEO, even though uh, we're ranked on the third page, like we'll eventually get to the first or whatever that may be. So I think that that's a that's a really good kind of examples you used even just about yourself. I, I appreciate that as that's always uh, helpful. What is what is something in marketing business that you failed in a mistake you made that now looking back has been helpful or obviously in the moment wasn't but does anything come to mind as one of your biggest failures your biggest mistakes in business marketing all of uh what you do yeah well i would say that uh, many years ago when i was a marketing consultant um i tried to <laughs> i tried to pick on what i thought was the the latest thing, but it turned out it wasn't. So uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a time where people were talking about web series and it was just doing like a series of videos of like putting like just independent filmmakers, independent uh, video producers, just doing their own series on YouTube and stuff like that. Right. Uh, and sort of like betting against Netflix. <laughs> which is uh, doesn't make a lot of sense today but uh i tried that uh creating that i spent a lot of time uh, pitching uh networks and all of that working with uh with a team on, on creating original series and stuff like that and trying to do like sponsored uh products within the the series and stuff like that uh i think it, it didn't go anywhere but it was a it was a great learning experience, you know, just uh, how you can uh, think sometimes that uh, this is the next big thing and and it and it isn't right. I was listening to um, an audio book yesterday about this guy who uh, I don't know if uh, if you know Pioneer many years ago they created uh, the laser disc, which is the precursor to the DVDs. Uh, but they were the first ones to do it, but the market wasn't prepared for it and they just abandoned it, right? And the reason was that they were trying to sell this uh, laser disc where people could watch movies of better quality. But people say, yeah, but I cannot record my favorite show on it like I can do on the, on the VHS, right? So they didn't think about what people wanted. So going back to that like i thought this is trendy people are doing it, it looks shiny but uh people really really want it right people are why would i watch something i don't know on youtube what's what's in it for me what's different there's it's just a different 
channel but there's nothing different about it and that's that's something that i learned if i want to 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 just attract attention i have to innovate and not just uh tweak a bit and do something a little bit different and one of the things for my new book is don't just be better this is my slogan like don't just be better than the competition be the only one and that's that's all about niching or being the only person like you kind of said when someone thinks of x industry x problem no that's good that's it yeah i never knew that story about pioneer and the laser disc and yeah that's way probably before my time i'm a i don't even know what i am a millennial or gen z y x but uh no that's good that's a good one so i have a question as i look through your linkedin and in kind of your point about you've written books i think that's an understatement i've written books and i have three books or whatever that is but you've written books and you've written 15. how do you write 15 books i mean you don't seem that old like you're you know 65 and you've spent how do you go about writing that many i know they're all different genres maybe in different topics but how do you write 15 books I apply something called the button method. And the button method is I put my butt on the chair and write. It's a good method. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, just take it as a job, right? I like, like uh, some people think that a writing is about waiting for the muse to inspire you and getting this mystical experience where you feel inspired. And you know what? It's, it's not, it's, it's hard work. And you just have to sit down and plan it out and research and do it. It's like a, you don't expect a lawyer to just have the muse of, of uh, you know, um, lawyering or whatever to calm down <laughs> to do the work. Or you expect a salesperson to just get inspired to make that call or to write that email or to go and prospect. No, they just have to do it. And it's the same with writing, right? So... Uh, I think because of the nature of what writing or authors are, like they're this kind of uh, special people that we put in a, on a place like, oh, wow, how can you do that? And we do that with artists and celebrities, right? So we think it's, it's too hard. So uh, I don't know if I could do that. But when you just bring it down to earth and say, okay, it's just a matter of stringing words together putting your ideas on writing. And then yes, there are techniques, there are things you can do to improve. There's, uh, <clears throat> there's grammar, there's, uh, there's um, you know, structures, outlines and stuff. And you learn that through time, but it's just a matter of using the button method. Hmm, that's good, that's good. Um, yeah, I mean, it's as simple as that, but as also as complex that you do have to make the time, carve it out. How do you now, this might be a question that's like hard to answer, but how do you come up or create steady streams of ideas? And obviously your point is you don't always have ideas to sit, you just sit and write. But like, what are you doing or how do you keep ideas capturing them? Or what is your kind of idea generation process? Or is it more free flowing? No, uh, so if I'm interested in a topic, I would read about the topic. Uh, I'm reading all the time. I listen to audiobooks while I work out, listening to stuff, uh, talking to people about uh, about topics, right? And trying to connect dots, right? So sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm just working out, right? And I'm listening to an audiobook and something that I hear just sparks an idea and I have to stop and take notes. So I'm, I'm always like on my phone, I have a, a Evernote, the Evernote app. And I have notes there for everything, like ideas for for books, ideas for articles, ideas that I want to develop, ideas that I want to do research for. I mean, ideas are everywhere. And for a time I did one exercise is that uh, in the morning, before I did anything else, before work, I would sit down and I had to write 10 ideas. 10 ideas for my business and 10 ideas for my personal growth. And just having a constant stream of ideas, it's it's amazing. Like, I'm not gonna stop until I have 10. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be good. You don't have to act on all of them, but at least you're creating a mindset where you're constantly looking at opportunities and looking for new ideas. So it's just a mindset of, you know, writing them down and continue. And it's just a, a habit you have to create. 
Hmm. Yeah, I like that a lot. I, my my process is quite similar. I use I use Trello now. I use Notion, but the tool doesn't matter. I think the key is is that a first you're doing things to gain ideas, whether that's reading. Um, listening to audiobooks, even working out. So taking the mind out of work, you're gaining these ideas, you're letting them intermate, you could say different ideas from different books or different audiobooks, someone you read on LinkedIn, but then you're not stopping there. You're taking those ideas and putting them somewhere, call it an idea farm, you're planting them. And then you might, you know, strip those right away out and kind of make a post about it. Or for me, at least I kind of, you know, might add to an idea. Oh, this is another idea that's similar to that idea I posted yesterday. Let me put it under it. And now I'm starting to build, you know, a garden of ideas that then when I'm ready to sow or reap, whichever it is, I can go and do that. So I'm not like you kind of were talking about. I'm not sitting there like, what do I write about? The muse isn't here. What's her number? Let me call her. You can just do it because you have ideas if nothing's kind of coming up or you're not passionate about anything in the moment. I like that a lot because I think to your point, people put writers or authors on pedestals. I do think that's a case. They think they have this inherent talent or some God-given ability where, you know, as we're talking about this, for me, it's like, hey, this is elementary. But I know some people listening like, oh, I never thought of doing that. I have all these ideas, but they just stay in my brain. Now I'm going to put them on a page and that'll help them. So I think it's key sometimes to talk. We don't, I don't talk about writing enough. I just do it. And then people are like, you're so good at it. How do you do it? And I'm trying to do more actually writing on writing and I think that leads me into my next question is you had a post kind of talking about voice so how does a personal brand or a small business how do they go about developing a distinct voice because I'm with you I think voice is so important in writing but how do people companies go about actually creating that distinct or unique voice yeah I think things different for companies uh, it is for people uh, a company it's it's people, it's a group of many people, right? But people within inside the company have different voices. Sometimes the CEO has a particular voice and the CEO it's uh, charismatic and it's out there and it's, he's gonna just, or she's just gonna uh, lead the pack and use her own voice or his own voice, right? And that's fine. Uh, but sometimes as a company is that you have to have this discussion with your customers okay what's the voice that resonates with them what's the language they speak right so if if you are a b2b company and your your clients are sales reps you have to talk to the sales reps and of course there's a huge range like you have like uh 20 year olds who are starting as sdrs right and you have some aes who are in the 40s um but you know what's the you just have to find the average person there and what's the language they they talked uh, they speak every single day right and just go to that level right and also i mean how do you want to position yourself do you want to be funny witty you want to sound clever formal i mean if if you're selling to corporate clients maybe you have to be a little formal but if you're a b2 uh, b2c brand then it's different, right? You, you have to be like Nike or Apple. You have to think differently. But for the solopreneur, for the business owner, I would say just be true to yourself. So find your own voice. Don't try to imitate someone else. And you, you mentioned a post I wrote about it. And what I say there is just pay attention to what you sound like when you're with family and friends. When you're not thinking about how should I sound. And just something, just record yourself and pay attention. Are you, are you being funny? Are you the, the, the person who makes jokes and makes everybody laugh? Or are you the insightful person who just doesn't speak much, but when you speak, everybody's listening, right? So incorporate that into your writing. Maybe the jokes, maybe the insights. Uh, are you long-winded or are you brief, right? Just identify your, your own voice, your personality, and infuse that into your writing because it's... If not, it's not going to flow. It's, it's going to sound like forced and people will, will notice that. And people would say, ah, there's something that's not right here. There's something wrong. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. No, I like that you, uh, I tell a lot of people to record themselves, whether they're writing a landing page or whatever. Um, just especially when it's about you as like a person, because I totally vibe with that, that if you're funny, be funny. But if you're not funny, don't try to be funny because you think funny is cool because it's just going to be like you said, feel forced. You're not going to hit the joke right or whatever. And I like your point about companies. It's kind of going to the customer because depending on who you're selling to, like I may, you know, not like a company's tone of voice, their kind of voice, because they're selling to 30 year old mother, like, and I'm just like, okay, you know, I don't get this language, but for them, that voice fits. So I think that's a key thought process is what voice or what kind of, because as you said, you know, a company's a allotment of people. It's not just one person, but, you know, Gong, Drift, all of these companies do have somewhat of a unique voice as a company as well. And you can argue a lot of them put it on, you know, like uh, the Bruno dog for Gong, or, you know, if you think about Geico, the Geico, like they, they're able to do that. Um, so I think there's so many different ways of doing that. But I think a key is to really understand who are we selling to, who's buying our product, what would the language, which is key in the kind of tone of voice work for them best. And obviously don't come up that with that in your boardroom go to the customers and actually talk with them which is sometimes a really hard thing to do well i do you have anything else that was good i want to jump into my final three questions i think you touch on all my other questions that i had that just kind of threw out it so i'm going to jump to the final three it used to be the final two but now it's the final three so Few of these questions are going to be on marketing and on business, but the last one will be not on marketing, but kind of related just as a precursor. So the first question, what is one thing you've changed your mind? And you might've talked about this. What's one thing you've changed your mind in regards to marketing and business in the last, you know, two, three, four, five years where I believed this, now I believe this. And if it's something you already said, you know, feel free to kind of reiterate that. Yeah. Uh, I would say something I believe, uh, like, uh, I used to work for a company where SEO was the holy grail and I don't think it is anymore. Uh, I mean, it, it can work uh, to drive traffic, but I don't think it has a lot of business results. Um, uh, it depends. It works for some people, right? So I'm not trying to be dogmatic here. It may work <laughs> for some people. But the thing is, uh, there are so many SEO experts out there. And they're just trying to sell you and like results and I can tell you that's not it's not true they they promise uh, heaven and earth and but they won't be able to deliver oh I like that and that's a that's a tough one especially if you've been in SEO to kind of switch out of it because obviously if you're in SEO you almost have to uh, put that belief on your back of SEO is the way it's the only way where I kind of approach it more like you where yeah SEO could work if you're in a you know category or you're in an area that has not been saturated by SEO but sadly that's very few and far between for content it's almost better to take the route you're talking about have it be be the only one be different in your content have you know a real point of view yeah, so create, I like that and create your own keywords right um, <laughs> yeah that's one of your uh, that's one of your points it's, it's the long way right uh, people are maybe you know searching for them but then you start talking about it. Then you start doing real marketing and mm -hmm. that word is going to get out there and people are going to start going to search for it and boom, you're number one. <laughs> yeah, that's the Christopher Lockhead model, right? Is you got to create that category language. You got to build the language that nobody's searching for. That's maybe when SEO could be somewhat beneficial as planning your flag in there for those keywords you created. I like that. I think that's a tactical a action item for the listener as much as I like to stay theoretical. Okay, second question. If you could, you know, if everybody goes to sleep tonight and they wake up tomorrow and you could, during the time they're sleeping, incept an idea. If you watch a movie Inception, you know, get an idea in their brain that they wake up the next day and they believe it as their own belief for marketing. What would that kind of idea be? Huh. Mm, that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, there could be so many ideas, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know... Um, uh, something that uh, I'm really, uh, really passionate about. It's, uh, I mentioned pleasure, but it's, uh, and it's how it stands apart from being an influencer and just the, 
the focus of so many people in marketing to just uh, have views on likes and vanity metrics and that's what influencers go by like this just flashy thing and go from all those metrics that are useless and really create conversations really create an impact so that idea of hey stop worrying about because if you look if, if you're looking for a job in marketing like oh yeah, yeah you need to be a master at google analytics and and data driven marketing and yeah data driven marketing but if they were saying data driven marketing is talk to your customers and what, look at what they say and that's the data that we want no but they're referring as uh, page views bounce rates uh, likes mentions you have all this software just for brand mentions to to measure and, and all this uh, uh, traffic and and the, all these tools and i think people are just you know chasing rabbits down holes and it's not making any difference <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. So focus less on the vanity, focus less on, you know, what maybe doesn't matter and get back to call it the basics, but call it to actually the things that matter that maybe are harder to track talking to customers, uh, you know, qualitative data, but it's still data nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. That's a that's a good idea. I I'll try to wake up tomorrow with that more <laughs> in my head as I always slowly slip back to the stupid vanity metrics rather than saying, "Hey, am I actually resonating with people and going deeper with those the 37 that, you know, follow my newsletter or whatever yeah. uh, that is rather yeah. than saying, oh, "It's only 37." And here's here's the thing. It's just that uh, the like and the vanity metric it just gives you this dopamine high. Because it's an instant mm -hmm. reward. Oh, I have 37 likes. Woohoo. <laughs> I have a thousand views. Woohoo. It just, it's dopamine for your brain. But did any one of them become your customer? Did you uh, get any uh, meaningful conversation with them? Right? So, and, and you talk to people whose uh, posts go viral, and they will tell you that, was, that, that felt great. But in the end, it made it didn't make a much difference. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all just dopamine addicts running around here, you know, trying to find the next hit wherever we can get it. No, totally agree. Focus on what matters and let the numbers and let all that do what it's going to do because uh, in the end, it doesn't always drive results. I like that. So the final question: What is one thing outside of business and marketing that you do that improves how you do business and marketing? I write fiction. I tell stories. Mm. So become, I always say that being a storyteller is a superpower. So, and not only that, but I tell stories to kids. So uh, I teach creative writing to kids. Like my wife has, uh, is the director of an online school and an e-school. And I teach kids creative writing. And also I write the middle grade fiction. So, it's just having to tell stories in a language that's simple that a eight, 10 year old will understand makes you a better writer and eventually a better marketer. Wow, I like that. That's a first. Haven't heard that answer yet. A lot of walking, reading, stuff like that. That's a unique one and definitely one that uh, I would, I don't write nonfiction, but I have, or uh, fiction. I've written some kind of in my past and it, you know, building worlds and all of that is uh, incredibly important in the work we do in our business, whether it's creating categories or even just like you're saying, you know, writing in simple term so yeah that's a good one all right i like to open this up this last section just for you to plug anything you, you said you have you know a new book you have a newsletter maybe you have a podcast whatever that is this would be your time to kind of just throw it all out for the three to four listeners that are still here with us on the podcast yeah so if if you're interested in writing i have a newsletter it's called think write lead and basically uh what i do is the intersection between writing and thought leadership so how to write like a thought leader and I got some tips on copywriting, some tips on uh, just uh, positioning yourself. And if you go to my LinkedIn or even my, my website, my website is uh, diegopineda.ca, you, you can find a link to the newsletter there. And also, yeah, my, my new book is coming out. It's called The Solo Thought Leader and how to go from a solopreneur to go to expert in seven steps. 
and it's just a matter of something I've been talking about today and just laying out the framework of how to actually position yourself as an expert in your niche and just go to solothoughtleader.com you'll find it there and and that's part of uh, you know uh, talking about creating categories so solo thought leadership it's a new category in itself hmm yeah yeah personally i've never heard of that or i've heard of intrapreneur and all these other preneurs uh but i would say from you your content it was the first kind of introduction into the solopreneur and you also have just to add one more uh thing you, and i'll include this in like the link uh section of the podcast but you have like a free test i took it where you can kind of see like where you rank on the thought leader or the solopreneur kind of and it's really I found it to be I didn't check out the report busy but even just the simple it just shows your gaps which I find is super important is just to see hey I'm strong here but this is where I'm really weak and I need to uh kind of do that so that's something also I'd recommend to the listeners to kind of check out just because a it's free and b you get some you know good takeaways from it and I think anything that's free that is brings value is definitely uh, should be done yeah, so that's, definitely do that that's a thought leadership scorecard and there's also on my website, this uh, solothoughtleader.com, and it's based on the book, so it's seven categories, uh, and then it just you just take the test, 35 questions, takes less than five minutes to fill it out, yes or no answers, and it will give you like uh, the results of where you stand in each category, and then you'll get a personalized report with recommendations about it. Yeah, highly recommend that. Well, thank you, Diego, for coming on the show. I know this will bring, uh, it brought me value. So hopefully it brings the few listeners that are here some value as well. And thank you for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jordan. Thank you so much. And this is the end of the podcast.